Welcome back to I Remember Radio. Today, I have two very special guests, Ross Porter, and he talked his good friend Wink Martindale into joining us. So, Wink, Ross, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. It's a great pleasure today to be joined by one of America's all-time best radio disc jockeys and television game show hosts, my friend, Wink Martindale. Winker, good to talk to you. Thank you, Ross. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, let's start out at the very top. When you were born, your mother did not name you Wink. No. <laughs> My mother named me Winston Conrad Martindale. She liked Conrad because her favorite actor of that time was Conrad Nagel. And Winston came from, as you might imagine, Winston Churchill. Did it really? Yeah, he, he was another big hero of hers. So that's where my name came from. And then growing up in the neighborhood, a kid that I played with when we were seven or eight years old, he couldn't say Winston, and it uh, came out sounding like Winky. So I became Winky Martindale. And then, of course, you don't get in this business with a name like Winky. So I shortened it to <laughs> Wink, and it served me well. How long was it before you became Wink? And, and tell us when that's all started. Well, when I was on radio in Jackson, my hometown, when I first got started in the business, I was Winky because everybody knew me as Winky, not Wink. And then when I went to Memphis, WHBQ, where I was for seven or eight years, and really made my mark in Memphis, that's where we shortened it from Winky to Wink. Bill Grumbles, my mentor, thought that Winky was a little, eh, not right. So he shortened it to Wink, and I've had it ever since, Ross. At what age do you, did you start to think about going into the radio? When I was eight or nine years old, I always wanted to be on the radio. There was something fascinating to me, Ross, about being able to talk into one of these microphones and being able to hear uh, a person or music or whatever on the other end of a radio speaker. So from the time I was old enough to know what a microphone was, what a radio was, I wanted to be on the radio. All right. Tell us about... Life Magazine. Life Magazine was a pictorial that my dad used to get every Christmas. He was a lumber inspector and he didn't make a lot of money, but every Christmas he got a crisp $100 bill and a year's subscription to Life. So I grew up, Ross, uh, reading the pictorial Life Magazine. And every time it would show up in our mailbox, I would grab it, go into the back bedroom of our little three-bedroom house on Burkitt Street there in Jackson, close the door, rip off the, rip out the uh, advertisement pages, and I would pretend I was on the radio. Absolutely. So I would ad lib commercials around those advertisement pages, and it served me well because it did teach me how to not only sell, but to ad lib, you know, commercials over the years. And you used to listen to your mother's Soap operas on radio, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. I would get home in the afternoon from, oh, from the time I was probably in the third or fourth or fifth grade elementary school, West Jackson School, and I'd come home and mom would listen to Stella Dallas and When a Girl Marries, the story <laughs> of, of mother love and sacrifice, <laughs> and uh, Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Bill. I, they all, you know, 15 minutes each, and they were lined up for like three hours in the afternoon. Yeah. And she would listen to all of them. And so that, of course, interested me even more as a youngster into radio. And then on Wednesday nights, Ross, you might find this interesting. On Wednesday nights, my favorite show over the years, from the time I was, I guess, around 10 or 11 years old, was Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Guardian of Our Fundamental Rights to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. Now, listen. I sometimes can't remember my name, but I still remember this opening to Mr. District Attorney. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limits of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to deliver with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. And then the music would come in. 
Dum, dum, da, dum, 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 da, da. So you see, I was into radio big time. Wink, you've always been a man of faith, and your Sunday school teacher and your hometown of Jackson, Tennessee, played a role in your career. Tell us how. Well, I grew up uh, in the church. Um, my family was very religious. We went to Sunday morning church service. We went to uh, Sunday night church service. We went to Wednesday prayer meeting. And my Sunday school teacher during this entire period of my youth was named Chick Wingate. And Chick Wingate just happened to be the uh, manager of the smallest of three radio stations in Jackson, WPLI, owned by the mayor, Mayor George Smith. But anyway, I kept bugging Chick to give me a job because I said, I always want to be on the radio, Chick. I think you'll like me. Let, give me, a, but he, he wouldn't listen to me. Finally, one night, you know, every little town has its court square downtown, right in the middle of town. And one night I'm sitting there with a couple of my high school football playing buddies, Dickie Bear and Charlie Pate. We're sitting there on the, on the railing of the First National Bank building and up pulls Chick Wingate in his little Henry J. automobile. The radio station, WPLI, for which he managed, was on the fourth floor of the bank building. So he gets out, he's going up to do some work. And I said, Chick, hold on, Chick. Why don't you give me an audition? I, I want to be on the radio. He said, damn it, come on up. <laughs> he got tired of me asking him. So we got on the elevator, went up to the fourth floor. He ripped some Associated Press news wire off, gave me a couple of commercials to read, sat me in front of a microphone. And little did he know, little did he know that I had been rehearsing for this moment <laughs> for a lot of years, reading those advertisements from Life magazine. <laughs> so I was a pretty good salesman for a kid at 17. And I went through those commercials like Grant going through Richmond. And I went through the, the news copy very well, because I always took pride in my reading. I was always a good reader. So he said, wow, that's not bad. He said, you come down here after school tomorrow. I was a senior in high school. Come down here tomorrow. I'll have Mayor Smith here go on the station. And he will hear you do the same thing. And if he likes you, chances are he'll give you a job. Well, I couldn't wait for school to be out the next day. I got on my bicycle, came down from Jackson High School on Allen Avenue. It was about 30 minutes, a ride to downtown. And went upstairs. And sure enough, Mayor Smith was there. They sat me in front of the microphone. I did the same two commercials, the same newswire. And Mayor Smith looked at me and said, son, you got a job. Paid me 25 bucks a week. And that was my introduction into radio. Did you try to emulate any other disc jockey? I mean, did you listen to other DJs to get ideas? There was a DJ in Memphis during those days that we all listened to in Memphis as teenagers. Because at WHBQ in Memphis, they came into Jackson like a local. They were five kilowatt clear channel. And we used to listen to WHBQ. That was my dream station. That was my dream job to get to WHBQ because they played more music than anybody else. And there was an afternoon DJ who had a mellifluous voice. Is that the right word? His name was Dick Covington. He did a show called Covington's Corner. And he had this marvelous voice. And I remember... As, as, a, as a DJ or as an announcer on uh, WPLI and then later WDXI in Jackson, I used to try to emulate him. I would try to throw my voice down where <laughs> his was. And I'm sure I sounded stupid doing it. <laughs> but in answer to your question, there was him. And there was a guy before him on that same station that I listened to for years. His name was Bill Gordon. And he was enormously successful in Memphis and then went on to Cleveland, Ohio, and then to New York City and was enormously successful. So a long answer to your question, yeah, two, those two people I emulated over the years, Ross. Another station in Jackson offered to double your salary. That's right. I, I went from WPLI, my first station, to WTJS which was the Jackson Sun. They owned the newspaper, the Jackson Sun. That's what TJS meant. And they were a 1,000 watt station. So I went from a 250 to a 1,000 watt station. And I went from 25 bucks a week to 45 bucks a week. Ooh. And I was only there for a matter of eight or nine months until I got a call from the 5,000 watt station owned by 
a very wealthy man by the name of Aaron Robinson. And little did I know he had been listening to me when I got started radio in Jackson. And he really liked my style or whatever. And so he had his secretary, Ruth O'Neill, call me one night. I was on the air on WTJS. And she said, Mr. Robinson would like to meet with you. And I was so excited because that was the station, 5,000 watts. And so I met with him the next day and got that job. And they paid me $75 a week. Whoa. So if you think about it, Ross, in 1952, 53, 75 bucks a week, not bad for an 18-year-old. And you could probably buy a new bicycle with that money, couldn't you? I did. <laughs> But that, that was my, that, those were my stair steps in, in Jackson. And of course, I was at WDXI until I surreptitiously made a, a, uh, an audition on a Sunday afternoon when nobody was there except me. I sneaked in an audition. I sent it to WHBQ program director and thinking probably never hear from them. Within two weeks, they got back to me and wanted to set up a meeting in Memphis at WHBQ. I was thrilled to death. My, my dad drove me over there and I got the job and it was, it was truly a, a, a dream come true because I grew up listening to WHBQ and a show called Clock Watchers in the morning before I went to school. And I ended up doing Clock Watchers. Oh, so so that, was, that was so cool. And then from WHBQ radio, within a year, they, st oh, they went on the air with WHBQ television. And my mentor, Bill Grumbles, came to me and said uh, he wanted me to do a, a kid's show. Would I like to do a kid's show? And I said, you mean be on television? I said, I always wanted to be on radio. I had no idea, no thoughts of, of television. But sure enough, I said, well, you know, if, if you think I'm right for it, they called it Wink Martindale of the Mars Patrol. I was sort of the Flash Gordon of Memphis in those days. And I had six little Mars guards on every day. And every day sponsored by Coca-Cola, 5.30 to 6 o'clock. And we would blast off into space and segue into those old Rocky Jones Space Ranger movies, those, those, those serials that used to play between the feature movies on Saturday afternoon at the theater. And we'd play about five or six minutes of that and come back. And I'd interview these kids. And it was great experience for me, Ross, because interviewing, if you can learn how to interview a kid six or seven years old, you can interview anybody. So Art, again, Art Linkletter made a history of that, didn't he? Yeah, kids say the darndest things, and I can guarantee you he's right. Yeah. So I did that, and the show took off like a shark. It was an enormous hit, and I did that for a couple of years until it played its, played its, when it played its course. And then Mr. Grumbles put me on the air with a, I was sort of the Dick Clark of Memphis during American Bandstand days. I did one of those shows every Saturday. Let's go back to Mars Patrol. Did you dress up in a space suit? I had the turtleneck sweater, the lightning bolt across here, the epaulets. I mean, I, I thought I was hot stuff, Ross. <laughs> if, you, if you could have bought me for what I was worth and sold me for what I thought I was worth, you'd have made a million bucks. <laughs> but it was, it was, the show was enormously successful, and kids were waiting in line 10 deep to get on the show. And their moms and dads or mom and dad would bring them down in the afternoon. And it, it was, it was just one of those, it was the early days of television in Memphis. And there weren't, weren't a lot of local locally produced shows. And this one just took off like a rocket. I'm going to guess Wink, that teenage dance party was on before Dick Clark. No, actually American bandstand was already on. And because of its popularity, in fact, you might not know this. I've never talked to you about this, but I was one of a half a dozen guys up for that job on American Bandstand. Yeah, I imagine. Years ago. And I got to go to New York for an interview, but because Dick was in Philadelphia and, and, and was a very popular personality there, it was so close to New York, they uh, chose him. But I, I did this show, and again, it was enormously successful. We did the same thing they did on American Bandstand. You know, I'd have the kids dancing and artists would come through Memphis and lip sync their, their hits. Did you have Elvis on there one day? Elvis came by and... Yeah. For you. Yeah, Elvis. 
uh, that's another whole story if you want me to tell it. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, but yeah, Elvis Elvis was a, a guest of mine in 1956 in July. Yeah. And I had met him in 54 and was there the night he was discovered at WHBQ Radio. So we became a hit, a, a friend that night. And as a result of that friendship in 56, when he came back to Memphis from doing his first movie, Love Me Tender, he came on my show. I did the first film interview that was ever done with Elvis Presley. Did you ever want to be a sportscaster? Yes. As a matter of fact, that's why I used to pretend I was a sportscaster at the West Jackson Elementary School at, at recess. I would pretend I was, I was calling a football game or whatever we happened to be playing in the yard at that time. Wait, how many radio and television stations did you work for in Tennessee? I worked for three, three radio stations in Jackson, PLI, TJS, DXI, and then I went to WHBQ in Memphis, and I was there for the entire time I was in Memphis. And then when I came to Los Angeles in 1959, I worked for KHJ, and then I went to KRLA, and then I went to KFWB. I never could hold a job, Ross. I was going to say that. <laughs> you have been too permanent anywhere you went. <laughs> but you know, my, my dream job, again, in radio in Los Angeles was for the cowboy, Gene Autry. Yeah. And I was with him for almost 12 years on two different occasions, a total of 12 years. And he had what was called at that time the Station of the Stars, 50,000-watt KMPC on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. I got that job because uh, Jim Lang, who was the guy who did Noon to Three and also a game show host, Jim moved back to uh, San Francisco and that spot opened up. And the general manager, Stanley L. Spiro, called me about taking that position. And I had been working for a little station in the Valley called KGIL. And I always wanted to get out of rock and roll at KFWB and those being a rock jock. I wanted to play Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and that kind of music. I wanted to play the quote unquote good music. So I went in and sitting in Stan Spiro's office and I'm signing my contract and who walks in, but the guy in the white hat, the man himself, and Ross, I had grown up every Sunday afternoon at four o'clock as a kid listening to Melody Ranch on CBS radio. And, and, and so I had gone back so far with the cowboy and, of course, saw his movies. And in, in he walks and he knew who I was. And he came up and gave me a big hug. And I couldn't believe it. I said, this is Gene Autry. And I'm about to go to work for him. It was, it was really sort of an out-of-body experience, really. Well, let's go back a bit. Why did you come to Los Angeles? How did that come about? Well, I'd been at WHBQ from 53 through 59. And in March of 59, I, well, I had gone to my, my mentor, Bill Grumbles, who was, he, he was like my dad, my second dad. And I said, Mr. Grumbles, I, I really would like to spread my wings and see if I can make it in a larger market. And he, he, was, he could have been very mad at me but because I was sort of his star there in Memphis on radio and television, WHBQ. But he picked up the phone. He called Norm Boggs, who ran KHJ Television, and, uh, WHBQ TV and KHJ and WOR in New York. They were all owned by RKO Radio. And Norm Boggs answered the phone. He was general manager of KHJ Television. So I got this young man here in the in the uh, office, and he has dreams uh, of, of Malibu. And, <laughs> and Norm Bog said, well, had not come on out. Let's, let's do an interview with him. I'm, I'll never forget, Ross, I hung up the phone. And I, to show you what, a, what a, a country boy I was, I said to Mr. Grumbles, I said, Mr. Grumbles, what is Malibu? <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. I was, I was a redneck. Oh, but I went out, I went out for the interview and, and got the job. And so I left Memphis in 59 and went to KHJ. And that was my beginning out here. We can't get out of the Memphis days without your story about what happened on a summer night in 1954. Yeah, it was a hot summer night, the 10th day of July, as I recall, 1954. And I happened to be at WHBQ Radio that night. I was morning man. I should have been home in bed. 
But some of my buddies from Jackson wanted to see the radio station. So I had been showing them around WHBQ. And all of a sudden, I hear this commotion coming out of Dewey Phillips Studio. Dewey was a wild man, a, a DJ, who did a show called Red Hot and Blue. He had 65% of the audience. He played black music in those days wow. for white teenagers. And, and he just had the audience wrapped up. So I hear this commotion coming out. And I said, excuse me, guys. And I went in there. And it happens that Sam Phillips, founder of Sun Records, had walked in with an acetate, uh, an acetate of a song that he had recorded that afternoon about two hours earlier with a truck driver for Crown Electric named Elvis Presley. I thought, what a strange name. But uh, he wanted to test this song, this record, to see if he had anything. And Dewey, if, if Dewey played it and it was a hit, you would know it the next day in Memphis. He played it seven times in a row. Switchboard lights up. The song was That's All Right Now, Mama. That's All Right With Me. It was an old Arthur Crudup rhythm and blues hit that Elvis had grown up listening to in Tupelo, Mississippi as a kid. So that was his first record on Sun. And I was the one designated by Sam to call Gladys and Vernon, Elvis's mom and dad, to find out where Elvis was. Because Dewey Phillips wanted him to come down to the radio station. Wanted to put him on the air, wanted to interview him, of course, because this record was just, I mean, the audience couldn't get enough of it. So Miss Presley, they were listening and they're all excited. And he said, well, he, he was so nervous about his record being played. Wink, he went to see a double feature Western at the Suzor's Theater. So they got in their truck. They lived in low rent housing called Lauderdale Courts out in East Memphis. It's funny, I can remember all these things. Sometimes I can't remember my name. But anyway, <laughs> they got in their truck. They went down to the theater on Decatur, and they walked up and down the dark aisle, and there's Elvis sitting all by himself watching a Western movie. Whispered to him about the excitement, came down to the radio station. I met him that night, and he became my friend and was my friend until the day he died. And Dewey put him on the air, and as they say, that was the beginning of Presley mania, and the rest is history. By That was 54, and by 55, when Rock Around the Clock came out, or, or Blackboard Jungle and gave us Rock Around the Clock. From 55 on, that's when rock and roll really started to happen. That's right. And Bill Haley was one of the first, wasn't he? Absolutely. Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock. Now, what had Elvis been doing, Wink, besides driving a truck? Had he performed anywhere? No, not really. He, the only performance that he had made, as I understand it, up to that time, was on stage at Humes High School where he went to school and he had performed on a talent show there and everybody seemed to like him, but he had never really thought about making records. He wanted to be a singer, but he figured he didn't have a chance. So he was driving this truck for Crown Electric because he was going to be an electrician. That was what he thought he was going to uh, do with his life. And so he walked into Sam Phillips' son recording service one day to make a $3 record for his mom, the song called My Happiness, which had been a hit for the Pied Pipers. And he made this song for his mom. And Marion Keisker, who was secretary to Sam Phillips, liked what she heard on this demonstration record for his mom. So she put it in the back of her mind. And about six months later, they were looking for a male singer. So she told Sam about Elvis and they got on the phone, found him. He came down to Sun Records and just kicking around a bunch of different songs with Scotty Moore and Bill Black. And one of the songs was That's All Right Mama, this Arthur Crudup rhythm and blues hit from years earlier, from 1946. And Sam Phillips says, what is that? That sounds pretty good. He says, I don't know. It's just one of those songs that I like. He said, well, well keep, keep working on it. He said, I'll start the tape. So he put it on tape, and that's the way That's All Right Mama started, and it was the beginning of Presley Mania. And they went in the following Thursday and recorded Blue Moon in Kentucky, and that was the flip side of the single that Sam put out. Were Sam Phillips and Dewey Phillips related? Not related whatsoever. Just happened to have the same names, and we're good friends. Now, Wink, how many were in the studio that night? There were six of us. Who, there are, was... who are still alive today. Well, I'm the only one still around. I'm still the only one walking around on the planet. There was Elvis, his mom and dad, 
Sam Phillips, Dewey Phillips, and me, six of us. And they, they're all gone now. And I'm still around to tell the story. Wonderful. All right. You come out to Los Angeles, you get started. And along the way, you had a chance to do a rendition of, I guess you'd call it a spoken word song, Deck of Cards. Tell us that. Okay. In 1958, when I was still in Memphis, a guest on my dance party show was a gentleman by the name of Randy Wood. He was founder of Dot Records. And uh, his preacher and my preacher were one and the same. And so my preacher said, Randy Wood's coming to town. He had known him in Gallatin, Tennessee. He said, would you like to have him on your show? You can talk to him about how he got Pat Boone started, the Hilltoppers and, and Dot Records. And I said, oh, I'd be thrilled. Randy Wood came on my show. We had dinner after the show that night. He said, how would you like to be on Dot? He said, I got an idea or two that you might be perfect for and of course, I was over the moon. Are you kidding? So that was 58. And it wasn't until 59 when I finally came out in March of 59. And one of the first things I did was to go to Dot Records on Vine Street, right next door to the old Wallach's Music City upstairs. And I had a meeting with Randy. And during my meeting, Ross, he had an old 78 scratchy RPM, 78 RPM scratchy record by T. Texas Tyler. It had been a hit right after the war, 1946. It was called Deck of Cards, about a soldier who used a deck of cards in church because he didn't have a Bible. Well, he put this old scratchy record on, and I thought, as, as I'm listening to it, I thought, who in the world is going to buy a talking record that's semi-religious when the number one record that at that time was Mac the Knife by Bobby Darren, and it was Venus by Frankie Avalon, and he's playing this talking record called Deck of Cards. But I was determined that I was going to say, Randy, I love it. If he asked, what do you think? I was going to tell him, I love it. Sure enough, played it, took the needle off the record. He said, well, what do you think? I said, man, I think that's a smash. <laughs> no, thinking the opposite. But man, I wasn't about to, to turn down the opportunity to make a record on Dot. We went in, recorded it. And what happened to it? It went all the way to, I think, was number seven on Billboard in this yep. country, number five in England, and you sold over a million copies. And, and to this date, it's been a hit in England, Ross, five different times. Wow. Occasionally, a disc jockey will pick it up and play it, and there's a new audience for it, and it, it catches, it, it's caught the audience fancy over the years. And uh, here, it's... It's been on the charts uh, that first time when as high as number seven. And then later in 61, it came back and made the charts again. And when it was a hit in 59, I got a call in November. We did at Dot Records from Ed Sullivan. And I got to go back to New York to do it on the Ed Sullivan show. Now, again, like a bo out of body experience, I, I grew up watching you know, Toast of the Town, the Ed Sullivan Show. And here I am now standing on the stage in New York doing this recitation of Deck of Cards, which I had not memorized. My memory sucks. So they put it on cue cards for me, and I still have on video me doing Deck of Cards on the Ed Sullivan Show. Do you still perform that? Yeah. Every, every time I, usually when I speak or, or, or do something special, if they don't ask me, I make them ask me to do well, deck of cards. I don't want to put you on the spot because uh, I, I, my guess is you probably not memorized the whole thing. No, I don't. <laughs> but, uh, the, the idea behind it, give us maybe 30 seconds of behind it and maybe the, the first card. Well, let's see. Let's see. Of course, it was a story about a soldier who used a deck of cards in church because he didn't have a Bible. And see, it started... During the North African campaign, a bunch of soldier boys had been on a long hike, and they arrived in a little town called Casino. The next morning being Sunday, several of the boys went to church. A sergeant commanded the boys in church, and after the text was read, the prayer was taken up next. Those of the boys who had a Bible took them out, but this one soldier had only a deck of cards, and so he spread them out. And that's when I started going through the deck of cards, the ace was one God, the deuce, 
Old and New Testament, three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it went through, it, it went through the entire deck of cards relative to the verses and the uh, scriptures in the Bible. And then what was the conclusion to it? Well, at the end, the soldier said, and friends, the story is true. I know, for I was that soldier. Now, I wasn't really that soldier, but Randy wanted to do it exactly like the original hit was. And T. Texas Tyler, who wrote it, was that soldier. So we did it exactly like they did, except we did a, we did a, uh, we went into a studio. His T. Texas Tyler was a real country record. We went in and put a vocal group behind me and made it a pop, we'll say a pop version of a country hit. Wink, what about the day that you were uh, getting off the air? Some of your friends went downstairs for breakfast in the coffee shop. And you looked out the window, and a man was walking down the sidewalk. Yeah, I, uh, I used to go down to Aldo's restaurant for coffee every morning and breakfast with the record promotion guys. And they knew how much that I had enjoyed and revered the radio show Mr. District Attorney when I was a kid. And uh, they had heard me talk about Jay Justin, who played the title role of Mr. District Attorney. And sure enough... One day we we're having breakfast and a guy on a cane, an elderly fellow walks by Aldo's restaurant. And one of the guys says to me, he's wink. You know who that is? I said, who? He said, that's Jay Justin. I said, Oh my God. I got up and I went outside Ross and I, I, I went to him and I, I touched him on the shoulder. I said, excuse me, Mr. Justin. And he, in this marvelous voice, he's yes. He looked over his shoulder and said, my name is Wink Martindale. You don't know me from Adam. I work upstairs. I'm a, I'm a DJ on KFWB. But I, I said, you know, I grew up listening to Mr. District Attorney. And you would have thought that I had given him a check for a million dollars. Because, you know, he had reached that age where, you know, those days had long since gone by the by. And he invited me to come in and we sat in a corner far away from my promo guys and everybody, just the two of us. And he regaled me with stories about Mr. District Attorney and about classic radio in general for oh. over two hours. Oh, he even picked up the check for coffee. <laughs> but I was so glad, Ross, that I had taken that out or had that opportunity to sit and talk to Jay Justin because two weeks later, he had a heart attack and he died. Mm. And it was again. It was one of those, one of those rare experiences that you that you have during your lifetime that you think is just made for you for whatever reason, and that was that was one of them. Well, that just tells you something about your heart, because it came to you that man would be thrilled to have somebody recognize him after all those years. That's right. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is just beautiful. Let's go to. How you really got started out in Los Angeles, you were with several radio stations. What was the most exciting part of that as you got started in L.A.? First of all, did you have to adjust your style from Tennessee to Southern California? No, I really didn't, Ross. I, I didn't try to. I, I always had my Southern accent. I never had a deep Southern accent, but I never tried to get rid of it. I've had people ask me, did you take voice lessons? Because I've always had a rather decent voice, but I never took voice lessons or anything. Thank God I was just blessed with a voice that was made for, for radio. Somebody said, you know, you've got a, a, uh, you've got a face made for radio too. <laughs> <laughs> but I never did change my style. I always did exactly what I had done in, in Jackson and then in Memphis. And uh, I never tried to be a comedian on radio. I wasn't, I wasn't a Rick Dees, for example. I just did a, a good straight radio show. I always added some facts about the artists. That was my, my thing. And later at KNPC, I did audio biographies from noon to three every day of famous stars. And that was sort of my thing. But no, I, I never really changed 
my style from what I was doing in Memphis to what I did in L.A. Well, you, you touched upon that briefly, and I want to go back to it. I was always a fan of yours, and I think that's how we met one day. I told well, you. you're a man of good taste, obviously. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and that's how we got together, and that has been a great friendship that we've had. But I want to talk about what I, that you did in those days. And I don't know if anybody ever did this, but I've got to tell you folks who are watching, Wink used to do the three-hour radio program. I think it was noon to three, KMPC. And he would have, he'd focus on one particular singer. And the singer might be in the studio. It might be a songwriter. But those were wonderful shows, the way you did that and, and produced that. I was always amazed how the editing came about and you did that. Talk a little bit about that. Well, when I went to KMPC uh, and had the interview for the job with Stan Spiro, he said, if I give you noon to three, what do you have in mind? Anything special for, for that time period? And I said, yes, Stan. Uh, I said, Mr. Spiro. Mr. Spiro, there's always uh, an idea I've had in my head about wanting to do what I call autobiographies. I would have, a, as you said, a Neil Diamond or a Barbara Streisand or even a Sinatra come in and we would do the recorded interview and that interview might last for two, sometimes two and a half hours. I would edit the interviews, get rid of the stuff that didn't matter very much. And I would underscore the interview with a song like if it was Neil Diamond and Sweet Caroline. Uh, during the interview segment, I would play an in instrumental version of Sweet Caroline and that would segue into him singing. Sweet Caroline. Uh, when I did the Elvis Presley story, it was a week long, three hours a day for five straight days. And it still got the biggest ratings in the history of KMPC during that week. That was in the uh, early 1970s. But uh, that, that's what I enjoy doing, uh, Ross. How did you insert the records for us? Did you time the record and put it in? Did you and Larry put it together and say, okay, We've got a space here between me leading into it and coming out of it. Or did you play the re did you play the record live the day you did it? When I first started doing this format, we would add the music live every day. Yeah. And then I discovered it was so much more professional sounding if when we were preparing these these segments for the show, if we put the music, if if we underscored the music, which led right up to the vocal part of the of the song Sweet Caroline. It sounded so much better. So we ended up during the latter years of uh, putting it all together. In other words, it was a complete segment with music included. And that sounded so much better. And that's 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 why when you listen, Ross, it sounded so professional and so good. And to this day I've never heard anything like these audio biographies on radio. Yeah, that's what, that was my next question. Has anybody ever done what you did? I don't think so, because I don't think, I, you know, it, it took so much time yeah. and so much effort that very few people, I think, uh, that I've known would be willing to spend the time to, to make them come together. You know what impressed me most about your uh, comments there? What? Frank Sinatra and Barbara Streisand would come in and give you two hours in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to get both of them. Did you? They came in. Yeah, yeah. That's terrific. Anything else about your radio days before we move on to your fabulous television career? No, I would say this about radio. It's in my blood. I've often said, and I really mean this, that if I had to choose between one or the other, radio or television, I would take, even though there's a disparity between the money you can make between the two, usually much more in television, I would pick radio because it's so immediate. I, I love the idea that, you know, for the most part, everything's not pre-recorded. In those days, you know, we were doing it live. And there's something about the immediacy of doing a radio show live, whether you're playing music or whether you're doing a talk show or whatever. I love radio and it's still in my, in my blood. And in fact, this, this year, 2021, I'm, uh, my partner and I are going to be doing a two hour 
weekly show on the history of rock and roll. In fact, it's going to be called The History of Rock and Roll. And it's going to be syndicated on radio for stations around the country. So I'm still still there, Ross, still, still doing radio. It was-